we're seeing blackouts happening in China. We're seeing warnings about some major energy crisis heading into winter in Europe. We've seen a lot of this happening in California off and on. Myself and my guest today are actually both long time. I'm not a resident anymore, but we spent a lot of time in California and we saw this process unfolding itself. And we're here to discuss what this energy crisis means for you, what it means for your freedom, your future, your money, how to prepare, right? Because this is all part of this larger paradigm shift. Some people call it the reset. And my friend Mark Moss is here to discuss this subject one of the best people to break everything that's down that's happening, but then not just leave it like that. Then we go to the next step of what you can do about it and what's really going on. And pretty excited about it. Mark's got a live event coming up soon, actually, in Florida, where he's going to break all of this down, exactly how to prepare yourself. So if you're looking for an awesome group of like minds and an awesome live event, It's coming up here very soon, and the link is right there down below. Make sure you hit the like button on this video. Give us a comment right there down below. Shout out to our sponsor, which is Vizsla Silver, one of our favorite silver and gold mining stocks up huge so far this year, or should I say huge. And so, uh, Yeah, thanks so much, Jake. Always, uh, Always fun to be back on with you. So you were saying to me before, and I recall the video, it was one of of your big viral videos on your YouTube channel, which was warning the California energy crisis is basically coming for everyone. And this was quite a while ago when you make this, but now we're seeing those dominoes unfolding themselves. So tell us Yeah, so I made that video. What's funny is it was September of of last year, and um, I was actually down in Mexico. I like to go down way down south of Mexico surfing. And I was in the town with one paved road. Everything else is just dirt roads. And there was no problems with power. Uh, but back home at the time I was living in, in California, in California, they were having blackouts all over the place. And so I came home and I made that video talking about what's happening in California warning. It's coming for the rest of the country and the world. And the reason why I was able to predict that isn't because I have a, a crystal ball, which I, I wish I did. Uh, it's because as I made the case in that video, it's being done by policy. It's the policy that's causing that to happen. Um, you know, I talk about finance. I know you talk about finance on this channel. Um, and sometimes I get people saying, oh, Mark, stay in your lane. Don't go into politics. And it's like, well, you can't understand what's happening in the financial markets unless you know what's happening in the, in the you know, political realm. And so in California, they were basically making policy to shut down all the fossil fuels. California is kind of trying to be the example for the United States um, and and maybe even for the world. And so they were shutting down fossil fuels, so shutting down natural gas plants, shutting down coal plants. They shut down two out of three nuclear reactors. Um, And the goal, their most aggressive goal, is to move to renewable energy. Um, But a couple things happened. One, um, they didn't bother to replace it with renewable before they shut down the existing um, energy they had. Number one. Number two, um, they thought they could borrow energy or or buy energy from their neighbors, Arizona and Nevada, when they needed it. But the problem is when California needs it, so do the neighbors. And so there's none to go around. Um, And so I knew that that was going to be coming to the rest of the country and the world because they're also adopting the same policies. And that's exactly what's happening. Over the last week, we've seen headlines all over, if you're paying attention at all, Power outages or shortages from China, South America, the United States, um, here where I'm at in Puerto Rico, we've been going out with power for for a long time, all through Europe, um, the UK, I mean, you name it, we're having serious shortages. And just this morning, actually just today uh, on Bloomberg, um, Bloomberg Green, so they have a a green section, um, and the, the title says, Global Energy Crisis is the First of Many in the Clean Power Era. Now, this is on Bloomberg Green. This is this is on their green site. This isn't some like alt news source. Um, and that's what they're saying. That it's the first of many in the clean power era. These people are damn geniuses. I, I thought they were maybe pretty soon here. They'll be running out of like a hamster farm with Power California or something like that. And it's what's crazy is you were talking about it for a while. And, you know, if we really connect the dots, the writing's been there on the wall, but what is hard to fathom that we're beginning to see now is the real ramifications of it. I mean, this is actually could very well be a humanitarian 
issue. I mean, that's not even to mention just the um, vulnerability of the grids themselves to a, you know, a quote unquote terrorist attack or anything like that. And so break down the significance of this really when we're seeing China having these outages, we're seeing, um, we're seeing, um, uh, the calls for Europe this winter. We've had that in California and, um, Lebanon, you know, the whole place doesn't have power. And I was looking at that. I'm like, is that a testing <laughs> ground for what's going to happen everywhere? I mean, where's this go and what's the significance? Well, the significance is massive. And I think most people don't really understand just how significant it will be. And that's because everything is tied together now. And so, for example, uh, yesterday, I think it was CNN again, put out, uh, CNN put out an article saying that uh, warning grocery stores were going to be empty or have much less selection. And so they're warning that grocery stores aren't going to be able to carry near the amount of goods that they had before um, because of the supply chains backing up. Well, how does that back up? So, for example, um, jumping back over to Europe, um, they're having a massive, massive shortage of natural gas. All right. So natural gas, sure, we need that. I mean, we're going in, in Europe's going into the winter. And so people will be freezing, maybe even freezing to death if they don't have natural gas to heat their homes. OK, so. There's definitely going to be. Yeah. So, you know, that's a humanitarian crisis uh, for sure. But that's like that's like a first order. Right. But what about the second, third order? Well, what else is natural gas used for? Well, natural gas is also used um, for the electricity companies to make electricity. So when they don't have natural gas, they can't make as much electricity. So when we start running out of natural gas, we've seen in Europe prices have gone up over 800 percent. So the electricity companies now um, don't have enough natural gas. The natural gas they can get is so expensive that they can't stay in business. And through the UK, what's funny is a few weeks ago, uh, maybe not funny, but the UN is is preparing for this big uh, meeting on climate. And they had this uh, pre-meeting a few weeks ago. And Boris Johnson from the UK said that, quote, we want to be the leader we want to be the leader. So let's see what they're leading in. So the UK specifically sits on massive natural gas reserves, Na massive, but you know, they don't want to get it out of the ground because of, uh, you know, the climate. So they're not getting their natural gas out of the ground. In the meantime, they thought just like California, we'll just get our energy from France. But guess what? France didn't have anything to give them. And so they ran out. Also, they thought they could depend on um, intermittent power. So wind and solar, that's intermittent because it's not always sunny and it doesn't always blow. They're also called unreliables. And so this year was a particularly low wind year. Who would have thought? Um, and so they didn't generate enough electricity. Um, and then the other problem is, like I said, they can't get the natural gas. They don't want to get it out of the ground. They couldn't buy it. The prices have gone up too much. They've had over a dozen power companies go out of business. So that sounds pretty bad. 1.5 million customers are affected. But then what else does natural gas do? Well, natural gas is used for fertilizer to make it. Oh, well, what is fertilizer used for? Oh, to grow food. Mm, that sounds like a problem. So now we don't have natural gas. We don't have fertilizer. We don't have food. What else? Well, see, um, natural gas um, also creates CO2, not for the emissions, but CO2 that's used to process food. Package food. Oh, that sounds like a problem. Also, it's for uh, processing meat to kill pigs and cows. So we don't have any of that. That's a problem. Um, and so you can start to see how quickly this all starts backing up. Um, and so that's when you start seeing that supply chains will grocery store shelves will be limited uh, because of this, because we don't have the natural gas. We don't have the electricity. We can't make the food. We can't process the food. Uh, we don't have the energy to even drive the food to the stores anymore. Um, and that's just part of the problem. Then we have, uh, we'll stay on energy for now. Then we can get into labor shortages that are even going to be bigger. Um, but that's just one set of the problems. We have the gas in the ground. They don't want to get it out. Um, they've also shut down all the coal plants. Um, but, but don't worry, they can get natural gas from Russia. So now all of Europe is now dependent on Russia for natural gas. Uh, but in, in Asia, it's the same problem, but it's different. So all through China, they're also having massive shortages. Um, but the problem there is a little bit different. So there they don't have enough coal plants to go around. Um, and they thought they could rely on also intermittent power, this time from hydro, uh, hydropower. But they had like a drought year. And so it didn't produce enough electricity. Remember, unreliables, intermittent. And so now they're trying to procure, procure as much 
resources, as much coal as they can. So they're cornering the market, but they still don't have enough power. So now through China, they're starting to limit the amount of factories, the days they can work rotating, which ones can work at which times uh, because they don't have enough energy for everybody. So guess what that does? Uh, we're already not getting enough products from them and now they have to limit that. Um, and so we can really quickly start to see how fast this domino starts to fall down. Yeah, right. And you can see how a lot of these things connect into the World Economic Forum and their conversation on the Great Reset, right? Which you've made videos on the Great Reset, including everything from food to farming to energy and money. And you can see how it kind of con connects in. There's a problem, there's a reaction, and then there's a solution. I mean, if the food stay, you know, empty enough, you sent me an article the other day about the new taxes and fees that the Biden administration wants to put on yep. cattle farmers and a methane tax. how deadly yep. that would be a methane tax, right? And how deadly that could be. Then you go, well, so what's the solution? Well, it's probably going to be Bill Gates's lab meets that eventually once they have a global, uh, once they have a global food crisis, that's bad enough. Right. And you can see that how they're, 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 this is the build back better agenda to reshape society. And, um, it's just amazing. It's, it's not just the, the uh, back to the meat thing. I mean, it's not just a Bill Gates agenda. So in the United States, about 85% of all the meat is packaged by just four companies. Um, those four companies have been raising the prices, but also at the same time, squeezing the ranchers. So they're making it very difficult for everybody. At the same time, those companies, those same companies that control all the meat in the United States have taken uh, their money and invested it all into synthetic meat companies. So they're the biggest beneficiaries wow. of the system going down. Um, and it's no different than we see everywhere else, which is uh, don't eat healthy because we need you to buy our pharmaceuticals, <laughs> um, right? Don't uh, take cannabis. We'll make synthetic cannabis because we can't make any money off of that. Um, and uh, meat doesn't make as much money. So how about synthetic meat instead? And so we're starting to see that in um, these policies, again, right? This is all being driven by policy. That's how we're able to tell the future. Um, so the policies, they continue to pile on top of each other. So it's not enough that they said we can't get natural gas out of the ground. Um, it's not enough that they said, well, they spent, Europe spent trillions of dollars on these intermittent power supplies, um, or unreliables. It's not enough for that. What they also did to make things even better or worse, depending on which side you look at it, is the government thinks that, um, you know what? If we want people to, to quit smoking, let's add a bunch of taxes onto cigarettes and then people will quit smoking, right? No, <laughs> people just spend more money to smoke now. Um, and they did the same thing in Europe um, with what's called cap and trade. And so they said, what we'll do is we're going to start slapping carbon taxes on the energy. And if we do that, then for sure they'll find, you know, they won't use as much. But of course that didn't happen. Um, now what's happening is now these power companies that are already struggling to survive because energy prices have gone up by 800% on natural gas, 400% on electricity. Um, now on top of that, they're forced to buy these carbon credits. And of course, the law of supply and demand, as the demand for the carbon credits have gone up, the prices have gone up. And then the government decided to restrict the supply of them as well, which caused the prices to go up even further. And so at a time when we can't get enough power, then the government came with even more policy to put this cap and trade system on um, and limit the, the amount of power and, and increase the cost. Now, um, I'm, I'm not here to talk about the science behind this. That's a whole different conversation if you want to get into, you know... Uh, Get our, we'll get our asses banned from YouTube yeah and we and, and we don't and need to week, my point is rather um wouldn't wouldn't it make sense to at least make sure we've replaced the power before we shut down the existing you're already getting too complex oh. just this is too far <laughs> outside of these got guys it, heads it. you know like the question just be, the question is is this stupidity um or is this malfeasance and so I guess the way to answer that um, might just be by describing how you think it unfolds. So what's next? Well, um, you know, that's that's a good question. It's a question that uh, I've heard posed many times, a question that I've, I've pondered and discussed many times. Um, I would say it's both. 
Um, some people are ignorant. Some people are evil. Um, I would also say that it doesn't matter because <laughs> it is what it is. When I talk about investing, I like to tell people we don't invest in the markets as we want them to be, as we think they should be, but rather just as they are. And so rather, um, I don't know if this was evil or, or ignorance. Um, either way, it is the situation that we're in. But what I would say is that it, what it is a cause by is central planning. That's, that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. So we have central planning. That's the issue because when you have a complex system, like the body's a complex system. So if I have heartburn, they may give me something for my, a, 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 you know, pharmaceutical for my heartburn, but that would have all types of other side effects in my body where maybe I should just change up my diet a little bit. Um, but also the economy is a complex system made up of, in the U.S., 330 million people or globally, you know, 8 billion people that have wants, needs and desires that change constantly. And so when a central planner thinks they can just change one thing, then it starts to have this whole ripple effect going on. And so central planning is the problem. So how do things progress from here? Well, I would say that we are moving um we're moving into a cycle of peak centralization or peak globalization. So we can see I've done extensive work into these cycles that continue to repeat and repeat. I think we've talked about that. And about um, on a 250 year time frame, there's a revolution cycle that happens and the world basically um, goes from freedom to oppression to revolution, freedom, oppression, revolution. And so we're maxing out on this peak centralization, peak globalization. And we can see that. I mean, this is peak centralization, putting these rules in globally for the whole world. Um, these power leaders like Mark Carney, who's a guy you should probably listen to. So Mark Carney was the head of Bank of England, head of Bank of Canada, UN Special Envoy for Climate and Finance. He's an advisor to uh, Trudeau and Boris Johnson. He's part of the World Economic Forum. Like, you should listen to this guy. And he wrote a book called Values. I highly recommend you to read it. Don't take it as conspiracy. Read the words that he wrote himself. And he said that um, people think the future will be better, but it won't be. That's his words, not mine. He said, uh, people need to understand that in the future, they won't be able to travel as much. They won't be able to eat meat. Um, their cars won't be saleable and on and on and on. Those are his words. Well, Mark, one of the reasons that they don't, that it's going to be worse uh, and this is only if they only succeed, if they succeed right? So we're making point. this content. And, and and here's the other thing is that he's not saying it for no reason. When they're putting in mileage taxes through GPS microchips, it's because they're trying to stop right. your movement. They're, they are literally trying to not just centralize the economy. They're trying to centralize your basic uh, autonomy, your basic sovereignty. And that's why, you know, these videos are important. That's why going to events like Mark's are important because people are waking up and they know people are waking up. That's why they they ran that fake whistleblower who's a whistleblower calling for more censorship. They know what's happening. So if you're listening to this, we make sure you keep sharing this video. We got Mark's link right there down below. That's, that's a great, um, that's a great so point that you bring Mark? up about the mileage tax, for example. So, uh, coming, both of us coming from California mm -hmm. previously, um, California adds, uh, like, what is it, like 80 cents per gallon of tax per gallon. Yeah. So technically, already. the m more miles I drive, the more tax I'm paying. So aren't I already paying a tax for the mileage that I drive? So why would they need to? Yeah, this is literally a well, second Yeah, tax, but right? um, back to what's really behind this. Because if they needed more tax, couldn't they just raise the price of the gas tax? But no, to your point, it's not about mm -hmm. the tax. It's about the it's about the surveillance. It's about the control. And that even goes back to this, this you know, the 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 epidemic or the pandemic, whatever you want to call it, that we're going through today. It was never really about that. It was about trying to get your whole life into one switch that could be controlled and basically shut on and off with a light switch. Um, and I, so, so then is the way that it does it ultimately. So for people that aren't familiar, I've talked about it now a few times in Biden's $3.5 trillion thing in the jigger. He talks about a mileage tax. They're doing a pilot plan. It, it connects to basically a microchip GPS that monitors it. Ultimately it'll automatically pull the money out of your account. So then my question is, and you've talked about a lot of these things, central bank, digital currencies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is, is it ultimately a, essentially this GPS from the car connects to basically this, this microchip or app, app that ties into your central bank digital currency? You know, we've had, um, 
We've had the UN say in the future, um, your DNA will become data. So is it ultimately tying everything from your basic movement in your vehicle to, um, you know, this type of social credit score type of system? We've had the World Economic Forum wrote an article saying, talking about a new credit card that will like attach your carbon emissions. Is it to put all of this together? like that you tie everything into one like you said that then you can switch off and on yeah i mean i think it's i think it's pretty evident if you just kind of zoom out and see where they're trying to take things and again if you just read mark carney's book or you read klaus schwab wrote a book called the fourth industrial revolution he also wrote a book called the covid 19 great reset um read that book we would stick microchip in yeah yeah so don't 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 listen to me or jake and think we're conspiracy theorists just read their books and just hear what they exactly said um, I'd like to take them for their word. I mean, they did write the book on it. So um, if you read the books and understand what they what their vision of for the future is, and then with that lens, you now look at what's going on in the world today, then I think it becomes very clear what's trying to happen here. And of course, we can already see this uh, system, if you whatever you want to call it, social credit score system already being done in China. Um, and so it's just kind of a, a, a continuation of that. But the goal is really to have you... Um, they called it, uh, there was an article that came out recently and it was uh, freedom as a service. So they called it freedom as a service. And so you should have to earn your freedom is basically what they're saying. Um, and they would provide that to you as a service as long as you fulfill all the things they want you to fulfill. So as opposed to it being given to us by a creator, a God-given inalienable right, um, now we have to earn it from the government or whoever they are, I guess. I wonder how many holes we'll have to dig a day to get our. Food. Yeah. It it's amazing, you know, that it's so easy to see the way the dots are connecting, right? And um, it used to make me mad, or kind of, you know, sometimes maybe even scare me a little. But it's here, and it's and it's obvious, right? And so, um, uh, what are the things that one should be considering? One should be doing. Um, important ways as we wrap up, we see the game plan unfolding itself. Um, what are the ways that we can prepare? Well, uh, first, I will start with something, a, a bigger picture view. And what I'll say is that um, I believe that history uh, repeats. And so um, we are at peak globalization, peak centralization right now. But at the same time, we see the world is rejecting that and they're pushing back against that. I believe that uh, humans have this in, inalienable right to freedom. I believe that we have this drive, natural drive for freedom. And we can see that history just continues to repeat um, and freedom always wins. And so um, I do believe that there's great hope and prosperity in the future. So I do have a message of hope, not of uh, doom and gloom. Um, I think, though, it's all going to happen in this decade. So Lenin's famous quote was that there's decades where nothing happens and there's days where decades seem to happen. And that's kind of where we're at today. Um, it's pretty evident to anybody paying attention that no one could have ever guessed we'd be here you know, a year and a half ago. But yet here we are. Um, so this change is happening very rapidly, very fast. Um, so I believe that we'll continue with this centralization. They're going to continue to squeeze harder and harder and harder, but more and more people will push back against this. It's, you know, the physics uh, equal and opposite reaction. So the more they squeeze, the more pushback they're going to get. The other thing that's happening is that uh, I, I put out a tweet a few weeks ago and I said, uh, people better wait and watch and see what happens when a few million entrepreneurs' backs are pushed up against the wall. And so we're starting to see massive innovation happening on the technology side that is leaving governments behind in the dust. So what do I mean by that? Well, so for example, um, the ECB came out uh, three or four weeks ago and said that like 20 or 30 people had signed on to this bill to ban anonymous crypto wallets. Okay, good luck with that because I could literally make a million before I finish this interview with you. How are you going to stop that? They can't. And so what happens is it starts making them look irrelevant. It starts making them look incompetent. Um, uh, in the United States, I think 20 senators had signed on to this uh, ban, like 3D printed gun situation. Okay, how do you ban that? Because I can literally know the code in my head. And so they can't. And so we see technology um, advancing very rapidly. Uh, we have new technologies like mesh networks that are starting. Of course, we have Bitcoin, ways to store wealth and whatnot. And so um, while they're going to continue to squeeze, um, people are starting to push back. And I think, unfortunately, things will probably continue to get worse for the next couple of years. 
uh, until we kind of hit that peak until the pendulum starts to swing back the other way. Um, so maybe, you know, the next two to four years probably are going to continue to get worse. In my opinion, uh, when I say worse, I mean, uh, more restrictions on your daily life, more control, less freedom, et cetera, probably more, um, you know, breakdowns in supply chains, problems with energy, et cetera. Um, but then that's going to break. Um, we know that this doesn't work. This goes against natural law, natural laws, for example, gravity with enough money and technology, I can suspend gravity, but I always have to be holding to it. We also have a natural law called the law of sowing and reaping. And that means that I have to produce before I consume just the way it works. So we're consuming today um, off of the production of the past, but eventually that falls apart and that ends. Um, and so then I would say probably four or five years from now, the pendulum starts swinging back the other way um, and things start to get rebuilt. And probably my guess is by the end of the decade, uh, we kind of see the end of the giant nation state. Um, we have much more freedom. Technology has uh, created more decentralization, more control, more personal freedom. Uh, but it's really getting from here to there. That's the problem. I think I didn't know how I was going to look at my opinion now, though, is there's going to be breaks of this decentralization, not just in, in, in finance, right? But to stay along with that term, it's going to happen across the world, right? Whether it's rural parts of, uh, third world countries that don't have the tech for, for the world economic forum to be involved or whether it's Texas blocking these mandates yesterday, it's going to break into a yes. bunch of micro worlds. Exactly. And, um, and I'm excited about that because I know that there's always going to be places that are going to value freedom. Um, personally, I'm really excited right now. I hope you too. I hope the internet gives me, you know, at least a few more years before Klaus, you know, shuts my internet ID down or something. Uh, because I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of money to be made, whether it's online businesses, whether, you know, we didn't even talk about, you know, nuclear energy and uranium being an obvious beneficiary of this and the investment opportunity. So there's a lot of yeah. things I'm excited about, you know, other things, you know, this has prompt me to want to get a ranch and totally off the grid, sustainable property. So I'm pretty pumped up. Um, there's some other things, right. And I, and I kind of want to wrap up with this, right. What would you say are the most important things? We got all those things I, I mentioned. You're a huge Bitcoin guy. Um, you're, you're also, uh, uh, an investor. What do you think are some important things for people to be considering right now to make the most of the present opportunity? Well, I think, um, in order to take advantage of the most recent opportunities, I think you have to just kind of change your paradigm a little bit, change your mental shift a bit, um, and think, start to think of things in terms of purchasing power. Uh, that's a very important thing. So uh, most people denominate everything in dollars. Um, even in other countries, they're still denominating things in U.S. dollars or maybe their, their local fiat currency. Um, but it's time to start thinking about things in terms of purchasing power. So, for example, um, homes today in the United States. Are they expensive or are they cheap? Well, uh, well, I guess this is going to be a trick question because it's going to have to do with your purchasing power. Right. right? So I mean, it's just kind of a rhetorical that. question, but are they expensive or cheap? Well, people say that home prices have never been this expensive in U.S. dollars. But what if we price them in something else like gold, for example, or like oil, for example? Well, if we go back to 1970, the year before we got off the gold standard, it took about 650 ounces of gold to buy the median home price. Today, it's less than 200 ounces of gold. So home prices have never been more expensive in dollars, but they've actually, they're less than half the price in gold. What about oil? We can see the same thing. It takes about half the amount of oil today than it did in 1970. What about, what about rice? Well, it was about 47,000 tons of rice in 1970. Today, it's 24,000 tons of rice. So it's cheap in rice. It's cheap in oil. It's cheap in gold. Um, but dollars have gotten expensive. And so you need to learn to, uh, and you know, you need to learn to look at things differently and not just in that, because at the end of the day, um, wealth is not money. It's goods and services. It's how much we can buy, how much we can acquire with that money. Um, so that's the first thing I would say. The second thing is that. I guess based, based off of what I just said there, what you store your wealth in matters. So, um, I told you oil. I told you gold. I told you, uh, rice. But what if I stored it in something else like orange juice? Well, 
or oranges. Well, I lost money, right? And so what you store your wealth in matters. Some wealth goes up faster than others. And so look for hard assets. I like assets. I think, um, you know, as we see the central banks continue to print unlimited amounts of fake fiat currency, people will continue to buy real hard assets, scarce assets. Uh, so I think uh, that's why I like Bitcoin. It can't be inflated away. Things like com uh, commodities like uranium, for example, probably going to have massive What's your expectations for, for Bitcoin? We're starting to, you know, see a next leg up. You're seeing more and more of, of these, uh, places filing for these ETFs and all these things like that, you know, the yeah. bigger money. Um, you know, that's something you've, you've excelled at and we never talked about it enough. So just as we kind of come to an end here in the last couple of minutes, um, I'd love for you to share, uh, what's your expectations on it through? the end of this year and, and moving forward? Well, I, I don't typically like to try to pick expectations or set uh, price predictions in this short of a time period by the end of the year in the next two to three months, for example. Yeah. Um, I'm typically looking at my investments over multiple years, you know, five years. F I, I look at everything kind of in a five and 10 year window. Um, if we wanted to look at uh, Bitcoin, so is Bitcoin cheap or is Bitcoin expensive? Well, compared to what? Um, so is Bitcoin, well, Bitcoin's expensive compared to when it was zero a decade ago. But it's cheap compared to being worth a million dollars in 10 years from now. And so you have to kind of look at it like that. Now, how much could Bitcoin be worth? So if you and I were in Silicon Valley a decade ago, people were coming through pitching us on Uber. Uber got turned down by all the big venture capitalists because they'd never heard of it before. Finally, somebody you know entertained it. Well, how much do you think Uber is worth? Well, it's worth $100 million. What? How did you get that valuation? That's crazy. Well, the taxi industry is this big, if we can get percentage here. And the, the limo industry is this big. And the van ride share industry is this big. And if we can just get 5% of each of those industries, we could be $100 million, right? So that's the way you look at it with new technologies. What are they disrupting? And how much value can they pull? So um, if we did the same thought experiment with Bitcoin, you've heard many times that it's um, like digital gold. Okay. Well, gold's, uh, I don't know, whatever it is or today, 10, 12 trillion dollars. So that's, uh, and Citibank and JP Morgan have both put out guidance saying that they believe that Bitcoin will overtake gold. So, um, that's a 10 X just off that alone. Um, it's also been called like a Swiss bank account in your pocket. So, um, we saw there was those Pandora papers that came out recently and we saw all these people that are storing their wealth in offshore bank accounts. Um, but at the same time, they're not, they don't have the privacy anymore. They used to, we're seeing the U S is starting to have reach and starting to seize a lot of those offshore bank accounts. And so Bitcoin is a better way, a Swiss bank account in your pocket. There's about 30 to 40 trillion sitting in offshore bank accounts. Could it get 10% of that? Well, there's another $4 trillion. So now we're looking at a 15 X from where it's at today. Um, but what about even bigger than that? So how many people know their dollars are losing value? So they're putting them into the stock market, even though they don't know anything about stocks or they're putting into real estate, even though they don't want to be a landlord. And so could we take 10% from the stock market and 10% from the real estate market? Okay. There's another 20 or $30 trillion. Um, and what about the bond market? So the bond market, half of sovereign bonds today are negative yielding. Negative yielding. They're losing money. So could we take 5% or 10% of that? I mean, now we're at $100 trillion and I could keep going on. So now if Bitcoin could be $100 trillion, and I'm not saying it will be, but uh, what if it goes up 10x from here? So then is Bitcoin cheap or expensive? And so I think then you start to see it different. So um, I don't know. Does that give you a little bit of uh, where I think Bitcoin could go? Yeah, no, it's a, it's an interesting to watch. Um, and I, it right, like, Everything we've been talking about, whether it's energy, whether it's a financial system, whether it's the CBDCs, they've all happened and then some. And, you know, the ultimate is the fiat system, you know, and if they keep saying $3.5 trillion equals zero, I mean, that is a level of psychopathy. There's, there's something, there's, there's, you have to be so there's something bigger going on though. To say that. There's something bigger going on though that I'd like to just kind of, uh, we'll talk about just briefly. Um, is that, um, so Bitcoin is, uh, what, what happens with new technology? Um, like, uh, when we had electricity, when electricity was invented, it was kind of like a digital candle. Okay. But what do we need that for? Candles have been fine for 5,000 years, right? What do we need that for? But of course, electricity became so much more. So whenever we have a new technology, we try to put it into something that we can understand. It's kind of like this. Um, and so Bitcoin, it's kind of like digital cash. Yes. It's also kind of like digital gold. Okay. Sure. 
but it's so much more. It's actually a network. It's the first decentralized network that nobody can control and it's censorship resistant. So now on layer two, like with lightning, uh, about a month ago, I was in Dallas at a Bitcoin meeting and there was a hackathon and the winner of the hackathon designed a phone that can make phone calls over the Bitcoin network. That would um, now there's communities that I can host my community with my videos and my podcast and my community can chat between themselves, sending messages back and forth. But instead of going through WhatsApp or Telegram or Signal, the messages are going peer to peer across the Bitcoin network. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, especially especially when you consider the obvious, which is, yeah, I mean, even General Flynn, uh, I think it was like a couple of weeks ago, they shut down one of his credit card accounts. Um, they said they are not going to work with him anymore. And if Schwab gets this internet ID, I mean, there's literally going to be an entire parallel system that's going to be built. And anyone with a brain is going to be exiting the system in every form, whether it's the in, in all forms, the internet, the medical, the financial. And so it's a, it's an interesting conversation. Um, we got to wrap up here though. I'd love to explore that conversation further and, and get to the heart of it, you know, which is what the future could look like building a parallel system. You know, earlier you were talking about entrepreneurs always come up with solutions. And the, one of the things that I'd love to even discuss with you is this idea of a parallel internet that, you know, it's, there could be, a, Billions of people could join a parallel internet that just leaves these globalists in the dust. It's, it's already, and, it's um, already here, Jake, and it's already being built. Enough. And that's another topic yeah. for another time. But you would be surprised. Everybody would be surprised to understand this parallel system is being built right now. That's what I've heard. Yeah, that's what I've heard. And I know there's a lot of brilliant people in this world that are fighting the good fight. So I'm, I'm excited about it. Honestly, I, we're going to win and these losers are going to be left behind. It's going to be great. And so, um, Hey, look, for everyone listening to this video, uh, Mark's obviously a brilliant guy, um, covers a lot of ground, whether it's, it's investing in commodities, whether it's uh, real estate, whether it's Bitcoin, um, whether it's understanding the dynamics of this energy crisis, central bank digital currency, the reset. He's always one of my most thorough guests and one of my favorite people to chat with, also become a good friend. I highly recommend that you go to his live event. It's coming up here very soon. The link to it's right there down below. It's going to be in Florida. It's going to be in person. It's going to be fantastic. And it's going to be great to be able to connect that's with like big thing. people, right? Because that's what they're trying that's to the stop. Thing. And so the link to that is right there down below. Uh, Mark, yeah, I would just add to that, that, um, you know, thanks. Thanks so much, Jake, for, for building me up. But um, I'm having about 15 of the brightest people that I know of in the space coming to tell you what they think is going to happen over the next couple of years and more specifically what you should be doing about it. So here from 15 of the top experts talking about the political, the financial side, uh, building and growing and protecting your wealth, asset protection strategies, cash, cash flow strategies, uh, ways to increase your freedom, your sovereignty, passports, plan B, offshore living, all of that. Um, all those people will be there. Um, the speakers will be there. They'll be doing workshops to teach you how to do it while you're there on site. So you can literally leave with a plan to navigate these next couple of years to survive and thrive. Um, and then uh, kind of, I just want to echo what you said, which is it's also super important because having community of like-minded people is probably the most important thing out of everything. And so come meet other people just like you, make new friends, uh, meet the speakers, uh, hang out with us, build that community up. And uh, that's how we'll win. So we'll put the link to that right there down below. Going to be awesome. Make sure you hit the like button on this video. Give us a comment down below that says we are going to win. Make sure you hit that subscribe bell notification. Get notified for future videos. Want to thank our sponsor, Visla Silver, one of our favorite silver and gold mining stocks. And uh, want to thank you, Mark.